you go and do it. So I went to the foreign desk, and that was um, as an assistant, which essentially sounds grander than it was. I brought tea and coffee for the boss, who was the main foreign editor. Plus, I had this great opportunity. I was on the phone with all the correspondents all around the world, but just as a stenographer. You know, I was taking in their scripts. And then I graduated after a couple of weeks into the uh, satellite pool sort of area, what we call the feed area, where the correspondents sent in their uh, reports by satellite. So I would be there just sort of describing what they were, and then I would enter that into the, commu into the computer. So I'm sort of in the database kind of explaining to the network what, 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 what that those days. Then at the same time, I came in and I worked weekends, this time, for as many hours as I could on my own time to learn how to write, to learn how to do all the things that you need to do to progress. And after about a few months on the foreign desk, I became a writer for the, for the programs. Uh, at first it was weekend programs, and at first I was writing the kicker stories, the last stories, the funny stories at the end of a, a, of a show. Gradually I worked my way up to the big stories. Um, I remember in 1984, it was the, and I joined in 83, it was the presidential election year, and there were obviously the two conventions. Democrats were in San Francisco, Republicans were in Dallas, Democrats were first, and I really wanted to go. So I offered to give up, well, I didn't offer, I said, I'm gonna come by itself, and I'll fly myself out, I'll take a week off from CNN, can you just give me a credential so at least I can see what's going on on the floor. So I got there, and the political director gave me the credential, and he said, uh, after about, you know, <laughs> you know, well, we don't have enough staff, so you better get in there and work. So that was, you know, another wonderful experience for me. Obviously, they picked up my airfare, they, they, you know, had me in a hotel room, and I worked, you know, 24 hours for the few days of that convention, and it was fantastic. It was a great, great experience, not just in doing my work, but in absorbing the politics uh, of the moment. I was on the floor for the great speeches of Mario Cuomo, Jesse Jackson, um, all those big speeches at the Democratic Convention, and then CNN invited me back and had me in there planning for the Republican Convention in Dallas, so I did the same things, and again, it was a fantastic learning experience, but I always knew that I wanted to be a foreign correspondent. So I kept doing what I had to do, I kept, uh, you know, learning more, coming in on my own time, and finally, a lot of this was a case of sort of dead man's shoes, but not really dead, but people's shoes. I was, uh, um, I wanted to move out of Atlanta because I thought I'm not going to go overseas from Atlanta. So I thought, well, New York should be the next step. So I asked if I could move to New York. No, 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 you know, maybe, maybe, maybe in 10 years. Um, so I decided to quit CNN, and I wrote several heartfelt letters to all my bosses at CNN saying how much I loved it and how much CNN was fantastic and how I really wanted to stay, but I had to you know, follow my, my mission and my heart. So everybody was basically waving me off, except the president of the network. And he came to me and he said, I got your letter and I don't like it. Uh, come and talk to me. So luckily, for some reason, he liked me. And there was a news director, or rather, bureau chief. And it just so happened that one of the key New York correspondents had taken a six-week leave of absence. So they said, okay, if you fly yourself to New York, if you find yourself a place to live, we will take you on freelance to do weekend reporting, graveyard shift, and producing during the week. Um, and so let's see if you can sink or swim. So I did that, and I swam. I didn't sink. And then they kept me on, and so I became a full-time correspondent in New York doing mostly the funny animal stories and the homeless stories. And at that point, AIDS was a huge big deal. It was at the mid to, beginning to mid 80s, uh, sorry, mid to late 80s. Uh, all those kind of issues, plus a bit of the United Nations. Uh, and after three fabulous years, for me anyway, being uh, at CNN's New York Bureau, I really now really wanted to go abroad, so I kept pushing and pushing. No, 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 you're not ready, and this and that. Until, of course, there was an opening in one of the bureaus, and all the people from CNN who they wanted to send to the bureau, which was Frankfurt, didn't want to go. So there was me saying, I'll go, I'll go. So they said, okay. And they sent me uh, to Frankfurt. And I, you know, you know, you know, you know, in Frankfurt, I still hadn't got myself an apartment. I was busy covering some of the, the post-Soviet bloc countries emerging from uh, behind the Iron Curtain and becoming democracies. I was in uh, Romania and Bulgaria and various uh, East Germany after the war had fallen. 
And then I got my big break because uh, the Gulf War happened. Well, rather, Saddam Hussein decided to invade Kuwait on August 2nd, 1990, a date that I will remember forever. And again, I put my hand up, I'll go, I'll go, I'll go. And they said, no, 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 so and so's going from here. All these other much more experienced you know, war correspondents from CNN were being deployed. And I nonetheless made myself some air, air some flight reservations, and I gathered my team. And sure enough, <laughs> sure enough, the others couldn't get there in time. So they called me and said, you know what? You better go, because your Frankfurt has the best links to, uh, to the Middle East. So I got on a plane, and off we went. And I never came back. <laughs> so that was, that was my story. And uh, it should give hope for everybody, because you know what? It wasn't obvious. I worked really hard. I was willing to do whatever it took. And I was willing to take no a lot of times and not listen to no. And to keep pushing, 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 because I believe it. I did believe it. I continue to believe in it. And as I say, it, in my view, whether it's in a full-fledged democracy like this one, an emerging democracy like so many, peop so many countries around the world, or even uh, dictatorships and authoritarian regimes, good journalism is a pillar of a strong civil society. And we've seen it over and over again, and I believe that without good journalism, there is a much weaker civil society and a much weaker democracy. And in this country, unlike in any other country, you have a constitution that protects your freedom of speech and your rights. The profession is called the fourth estate, a both power and responsibility. So I hope, uh, I know you will all rise to that challenge and grab it with both arms and full embrace and, and, uh, and rise to that occasion because it's been immensely rewarding and it is an immensely rewarding profession to be in. Thank you so much for having me.